Thanks, Eileen. And I recall during those days uh, that you would actually be working harder than me and that I would be sending you emails. It's like, you know, do you want to get a drink? And it's like, I'm still in the lab. I'm still in the lab. I would actually already be home anyway. So, um, okay. So I'm going to talk to you today about the problem of spatial uh, navigation, which is a challenge that must be met by all uh, mobile organisms. Uh, so suppose I were in my office in Goddard Laboratories at the University of Pennsylvania and I wanted to get somewhere, say to Penn uh, Bookstore. So how do I plan a route uh, that gets me there efficiently rather than wandering around in a random walk? Um, well, it's been appreciated for some time that there are many different ways to solve this problem. So if I've been between these two locations many times before, then I can use uh, something known as a response base or taxon strategy. That is, I can implement a series of actions that I know from experience will get me uh, from one point to another. Um, now, in order to use a strategy like this, all I need to know is this uh, series of actions. I don't actually need to know uh, where I am or where my destination is in space. Um, of course, another strategy is to use knowledge about where things are in space. Uh, this is what's known as a locale or a cognitive map-based strategy. Uh, to use a strategy like this, uh, I need some way of assigning coordinates to the environment. Um, I can then represent uh, where I am, uh, where I want to go, and maybe other points of interest in this coordinate frame. And then route planning becomes a simple uh, problem of vector calculation. So, Knowing that Goddard Hall is here and that the bookstore is up there, all I have to do is plot a bearing or uh, choose a bearing that will take me uh, to my destination. Uh, now, the idea uh, that uh, we might have in our minds, something like a cognitive map, uh, was originally developed actually by Edward Tolman in Berkeley in the 1940s, but it really sort of, uh, the idea really sort of took off in the 1970s uh, based on. Uh, neurophysiological uh, findings from John O'Keefe and his colleagues. Um, he found that if he recorded from cells in the rodent uh, hippocampus, that he found that these cells uh, often exhibited a, a spatially related firing pattern. So 
Uh, for example, here's a rat uh, running around in a circular chamber, and one of these cells might fire when the animal is in one uh, sector of the chamber, uh, but not in the other point of the chamber. Um, so they label these uh, cells uh, place cells because the firing in one of these cells um, indicates that the animal is in a particular place in the world. Uh, and in a famous book uh, published in 1978, O'Keefe and Lynn Nadal argued that these place cells might be the neural instantiation of this cognitive map which Tolman had proposed in the 1940s. And we now know that in addition to place cells in the rodent hippocampus, uh, which fire when the animal is in a uh, particular location. There are other classes of cells in the broader hippocampal formation uh, that encode spatial quantities. So uh, the Mosers discovered uh, these grid cells in entorhinal cortex, and these cells don't fire in a single location, but one of these cells might fire in an array of locations, making up a triangular grid as the animal moves around the world. Um, and there are also head direction cells uh, which fire not as a function of the location of the animal, but as a function of the direction that the animal is facing. So uh, together, these cells allow the animal to represent its current location and uh, heading, um, and recent work suggests uh, that they might also be used to uh, plan a route to another uh, location. Uh, so that's all well and good, um, but uh, in order to use a cognitive map, uh, you need something else. So suppose this very smart rodent um, has a cognitive map of the pain campus in the tippy campus. Uh, in order to use that information, it first needs to figure out where it is on the map. So it must be able to look out and say, okay, I see this, so I must be here on the map and facing this direction. And the term that I will use for this ability is landmark-based navigation, which I will define as the use of perceptible features of the world to determine one's location and orientation on a cognitive uh, map. And what I want to do today is tell you a little bit about the cognitive and neural basis of landmark-based navigation uh, using data from both humans and animals. Uh, so in particular, uh, an outline of today's talk, uh, first, I want to talk about how we align the cognitive map uh, to the world. In other words, how we uh, recover our sense of location and orientation uh, when we're uh, disoriented. Uh, second, how as a critical part of doing that, we first need to establish a reference frame that's tied to local geometry. And what do I mean by local geometry? I mean something like the geometric structure of this room as defined by the walls. And third, I'm going to talk about how we perceive that local geometry, how we perceive the local scene. And finally, at the end, if there's a little time, I just want to talk briefly about, you know, what is a cognitive map anyway? Okay. Um, and before I get too far into it, I want to acknowledge the people in my, well, uh, the people uh, who did the work. Uh, so, Steve Marchetti and Mick Bonner are postdocs in my lab. Uh, Josh Julian, Alex Kinath, and Lindsay Bass were graduate students, and this is my collaborator, Isabel Muzio. And you'll see their names down here on the bottom right as I go through the talk. Okay, so first, aligning the cognitive map to the world. Um, so what do I mean by that? Well, basically, when Mickey looks out at the world, how does he, if he has this map in the world, how does he understand the relationship between the sort of egocentric axis of his body and the coordinate axis of his cognitive map. How does he relate those two coordinate frames? Um, well, in order to solve this problem, it would be useful to pay attention to features that are fixed to the terrestrial surface, or maybe even better, the terrestrial surface itself. Uh, indeed, this idea uh, is one that uh, Randy Gallistol is uh, sort of famous uh, for uh, promulgating. Um, so he argues that uh, the sort of lay of the land, uh, the geometry of the environment, is a particularly important uh, cue, uh, if, in part because of its durability. So he argues that, or wrote that, what does not change, barring, barring a rare catastrophe like the eruption of Mount St. Helena, is the macroscopic shape of an animal's environment. A tree may fall or a boulder may tumble down, but none of these minor events alters the overall shape of the environment. So, uh, the argument here is, is that this scene, this like pastoral scene, might look very different in the winter, right? With uh, snow on the ground and on the trees, uh, but the slope of the ground and the arrangement of the hills will remain uh, unchanged. And similarly, similarly, uh, this room here uh, obviously has seen better days, 
Um, but although the uh, carpeting and the wallpaper are probably changed from its glory years, the arrangement of the walls, the windows, and the doors are probably unchanged. So that's uh, something that's worth paying attention to because it's a durable feature uh, of the environment. Now, uh, Gallo still based uh, these ideas not just on you know, thinking about them, but on uh, experimental data that he and Ken Chang collected in the late 1980s at the University of Pennsylvania. In a uh, famous uh, behavioral paradigm, uh, they would uh, teach an animal, uh, in their case a rodent, um, that there was a reward to be found in one corner of a rectangular chamber. So here's a top-down view of the chamber, and there are four little sandboxes that the animal could search for a reward, and the animal learns that uh, digging in this corner, um, he can find something. The other corners, there's not. And then the animal is removed from the chamber, disoriented by spinning them around, or uh, there are other forms of disorientation, but spinning is an easy way to do it. And then uh, placed back in the chamber facing a random direction. So now the animal uh, doesn't know which way it's facing and has to use the cues in the chamber uh, to recover a sense of direction. And what they found was something really, really interesting, and that was that um, although the animal would often go to the correct location and dig for reward in that corner, it almost equally often would go to the diagonally opposite of location. Um, and what's interesting about that is that these two corners are kind of equivalent with regard to the geometry of the room. So in both of these corners, the long wall is to your right. Okay? Um, and uh, the, uh, they would exhibit this behavior even if there was a non-geometric cue, like a very prominent visual marking along one wall, which in theory should disambiguate these two corners. But the animals didn't seem to uh, use that visual cue. They only seemed to use the shape of the room in order to recover their direction. You said Barbara Landau was here. Did she uh, talk about this at all? It's one of the things mm -hmm. that she discussed. A little she, bit. A little I think it was bit. Yeah. What's that? Yeah. It was it's, right. It's right. It's it's right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. I'm finding it hard to distinguish the two of you. <laughs> Where the reward is in this corner. So, yeah. If you did it instead of a visual cue with the stripes on the wall, if you put scented stuff. Yeah, that, that doesn't work. It doesn't. So it's not just that they're not great at visual. Yeah. It has to be geometric. And I should say that they can tell this. I mean, in our experiments, um, you can do a test to show that they can really see that. Um, so it's not that they're blind to it. Uh, it's just they don't use it for reorientation. Um, so, okay. So this effect of uh, reorientation to geometry has been found in uh, many other species, including uh, human infants. And, uh, you know, there's been this long-standing debate about what this means. So Gallistel um, argued that this was evidence for a informational encapsulated geometric module uh, for reorientation. Um, and other people have uh, disagreed with this modularity uh, claim. And this has been an important debate in cognitive science, but I'm going to ignore it, actually. Um, so, because for my purposes, uh, all I want these data to do is establish the point that geometry is a very uh, important cue for reorientation. And that's something that all researchers in the field uh, agree upon. Okay. So here is an example of the data, um, you know, using this paradigm, uh, just sort of a replication of this paradigm that uh, my collaborator Isabel Musio and I and our students uh, collected in mice. So here's a top-down view of the chamber. Uh, you can see the mouse down here. You can sort of see the four sandboxes. There's a very prominent visual cue along one end. Um, and here is, are the uh, percentage of searches uh, across different trials, the animals disoriented before each trial. And you can see that the animal often searches in the correct corner, but about equally often searches in the diagonally opposite corner. Um, and very rarely uh, searches in the uh, two geometrically inappropriate corners. Okay. So that behavior has been well established. This is nothing I knew here. Uh, this is basically just a replication of Cheng and Gallistel's results. Uh, but we were interested in what is the relationship between this behavior and the hippocampal cognitive map. Um, so we reasoned that uh, if the hippocampus is representing the cognitive map, um, and if this behavior indicates sort of a geometric reorientation of the cognitive map, that we would see some, something in the hippocampus that looked like that. And very surprisingly, uh, no one had looked at this. In fact, I was kind of shocked. I kept you know, asking people, well, surely someone's looked at this, but apparently no one had. So we recorded uh, from hippocampal place cells in mice uh, while they performed this sort of classic uh, reorientation task. So, uh, here's an example of what we found. 
so this is uh, recording uh, this uh, firing pill of a single uh, play cell across multiple trials, and the animal is disoriented uh, between each trial. And what you can see very clearly here is that this place field has two possible locations, one in the top right corner and the other 180 degree rotation of that uh, location. Uh, so that's pretty much what you would predict um, if, in fact, what we're seeing here is geometric reorientation of the top of the map. Uh, now, what's the relationship between this and the behavior of the animal? Well, here are the search locations of the animal. Sometimes the animal searches in the correct location. Sometimes it search, makes a geometric error, so it uh, searches in the diagonally opposite location. Uh, and occasionally it makes a non-geometric error, but not that often. And as I think probably some of you can see, is that there's a strong correlation here between uh, the alignment of the hippocampal map and the behavior of the animal. So when the map is aligned this way, the animal searches in the correct corner. When the map is aligned this way, the animal tends to search in the diagonally opposite uh, corner. Uh, and in fact, this uh, correspondence between the neural firing and the behavior of the animal is so strong that we can use the neural firing to predict the behavior of the animal. So if, let's say, this is the firing of one cell on one trial, we can compare that to the average firing field um, on other trials where the animal uh, searched in the correct corner um, and other uh, uh, trials where the animal searched in the uh, made a geometric error, searched in the diagonally opposite corner, and you can see just by comparing these two that if you had to guess, you would say that the animal searched in the correct corner here, and in fact, that's what it did. And if you sort of do this classification across all cells um, and uh, all animals, we see that on average, we can classify the behavior of the animal with 80% um, accuracy. And uh, just to show you that it really is geometry here that's reoriented the cognitive map, I want to show you another set of data in these animals uh, where we didn't just use a rectangular chamber, but we also used a square and a triangular chamber. Um, and what happens in the rectangular uh, chamber? Well, what I just showed you, uh, which is that you basically get two possible place field locations. And what I've shown you here is not just one cell, but another cell that was simultaneously recorded. And you can see that uh, the cells sort of rotate together. So it's not just that one cell changes the location, the entire hippocampal map uh, rotates, uh, rotates together. Um, of course, the rectangle has two-fold symmetry, so the square has four-fold symmetry, so you would think, well, what happens in the square? You would expect to see four possible firing locations, and that's what you see. You see four <coughs> possible firing locations, and if you report from two cells, you see that they rotate in sync with each other. And finally, the triangle has no rotational symmetries here, uh, and indeed, what we find here is that in the triangle, there's uh, only one uh, place field uh, location. So I think these uh, data indicate is sort of bearing out uh, what Gallister would have predicted, and that's the geometry of the environment is used to align the cognitive battery. The animal's disoriented and placed back in the chamber. Uh, it looks out and it sees the world. Uh, and then it forms some representation of how it's oriented relative to the local geometry, not using the, the visual feature, at least in these data. Uh, and then uses that to align this cognitive map, which includes a representation of where the reward is, and that is what guides the behavior. Um, and if you think about uh, what this might be, you know, not for a rat uh, or a mouse uh, in a chamber, but to a person uh, who maybe gets disoriented walking around the city, I think, you can imagine, well, let's say you're disoriented, you look out, you see the visual scene, um, and then you uh, form some representation of how you're aligned relative to the geometry of that scene, uh, which in this case uh, would be like the uh, facade of the building and the alignment of the street and the steps here. Um, and then you could use that to figure out which way you're facing relative to your cognitive map of the city. This is actually Chicago, so if you're facing uh, this uh, facade of the Art Institute, you must be facing today. So this theory uh, suggests that critical to this reorientation is this ability uh, to form a representation of your heading relative to local geometry. Um, so where is this in the brain? I mean, I showed you that the consequence of that is that the hippocampal map gets aligned to geometry. But exactly where this takes place or how it takes place is something we didn't, we didn't know. Um, so that brings me to the uh, second part of the talk. How do we establish? a reference frame that's anchored to local geometry, say to the local shape of this frame. Um, and in this section, I'm actually going to switch species. Um, so no longer be talking about rodents, I'm going to talk about humans. 
um, but we believe that the systems are probably similar um, in, in two species. So I'm also going to move beyond the hippocampus now in order to answer this question. So uh, what I'm showing you here is a meta-analysis of 24 fMRI studies of spatial uh, navigation, so different studies where people did some sort of navigational task while their uh, brain uh, activity is monitored with fMRI. And this is showing uh, areas that are uh, commonly activated across these studies. And what you find here is that you don't just see activity in the hippocampus and the entorhinal cortex, you see this broader network of regions involved in spatial navigation, including the parahippocampal cortex, the retrosplenial cortex, and the parietal lobes. Um, now this broader network was actually quite uh, interesting to me because uh, some of these areas um, are actually activated not when you just to perform a navigational task, but even if you simply uh, view navigationally relevant stimuli. So um, if you just uh, put people in a scanner and ask them to passively view pictures of things, you find that there's three regions of the brain that get more active when you view what you might broadly call scenes, so say, city streets, landscapes, and rooms. Uh, more active than, say, faces, objects, or other interesting things. The parahippocampal, <coughs> uh, the retrosplenial complex, and the occipital uh, place area. Um, and in fact, as Eileen alluded to in her introduction, historically, this is what I was interested in. I was, I was trained as a vision scientist, and I got into this because I was just interested in how you perceive visual scenes, and got studying these areas, and then realized that actually they're very involved in spatial navigation. Uh, now, in this section, I'm going to focus on this region, the retrosplenial uh, complex, uh, because as you'll see, this region seems to be very critical for spatial uh, reorientation. Um, uh, so here it is in humans, and there's an equivalent uh, region uh, in rodents. Okay. Now, just as a piece of evidence that that might be the case, on the right here um, is a figure from a review paper from uh, Kravitz and colleagues, and this is showing the anatomical connections between the parietal lobe and the medial temporal lobe in the macaque monkey. Okay, so we know in the parietal lobe that there's a lot of there's strong evidence for sort of an egocentric representation of space. Uh, we know that in the medial temporal lobe in the hippocampus that that's where we get the place cells, the grid cells, the head direction cells, all the things that we think form the neuron instantiation into the cognitive map. And as you can see, the retrosplenial region is perfectly situated to mediate between the egocentric and the allocentric representation, which is, of course, what you're doing when you're uh, reorienting yourself. Additional evidence for a uh, strong uh, involvement of this retrosplenial region in, uh, in spatial uh, reorientation comes from the neuropsychology literature. So if you look at uh, patients who have suffered a stroke, um, in this region, you get this really interesting syndrome um, uh, that's been labeled heading disorientation. So here is a, a case report uh, from Eno and colleagues. Um, so they looked at one of these patients and they reported that on the evening of December 11th, 2000, a 55-year-old right-handed man with a history of hypertension who had been working as a taxi cab driver in Kyoto City for 10 years suddenly lost his knowledge of the route to his house while returning home after work. He could recognize buildings in the landscape and therefore understand where he was. But the landmarks that he recognized did not provoke directional information about any other places with respect to those landmarks. Consequently, he could not determine which direction to proceed to go home. Now, I find this report fascinating. Basically, this guy, he could look out at buildings and, and you know, his surroundings, and he could identify the buildings. He could say what they were, but somehow, you know, he wasn't able to use them to orient himself. He couldn't use those, uh, his surroundings to align, to reorient his uh, cognitive uh, map. So we thought this was interesting, and uh, we wanted to uh, see if uh, we could uh, find evidence in normal, non brain damaged uh, subjects that this retrospinial region was involved in spatial reorientation. Um, uh, in particular, uh, this uh, operation of retrieving heading relative to local geometry. So to do this, we had to establish two things. Uh, first, that RSC is, in fact, representing your heading, the direction you're facing during spatial reorientation. And second, uh, that it is coded relative to local geometry. OK, so to do this, uh, we designed a virtual environment that was optimized for looking at uh, different headings. So here's a top-down schematic of the environment. And the cover story here is that uh, this is a, a park with four museums, okay. 
And the key aspect here is that these four museums, as you can see, all have the same internal geometry, so they all have the same rectangle, but they're laid out in this cloverleaf pattern so that they're facing different directions. So if you're in this museum and you're facing away from the door, that direction is north, right, in the virtual park. But if you leave that museum and go into this museum, now facing away from the door is facing to the east. As you'll see, this will actually be optimized. This will actually allow us to identify uh, heading codes uh, which are either local or global. Okay, just to give you a sense for what this looks like, um, here is, if you're in the park, so we're, we have these four museums, so we're just navigating around here. The museums are all different from the outside. They all have visually different appearances. And we go inside one, and the insides are very visually distinct as well. Um, although, as I mentioned, they all have the same basic, um, same basic uh, rectangle shape. Okay. Now, it wouldn't be a museum if it didn't have exhibits. Um, so, as you can see here on the floor plan, uh, there are uh, eight exhibits uh, in each uh, museum. And we'll zoom in here on one. So, here's an example. This is a lamp. Um, and so, they're not very interesting. It's not very interesting. It's only bad Yeah. It's a museum of like ordinary stuff. I know you never saw ordinary stuff. Um, now, a critical aspect here is that each uh, exhibit is on is in one of these alcoves, and that's actually going to turn out to be important because it means to to see the lamp, you have to be facing a given direction. So, if you're facing the lamp, you are facing to the west. Okay. So, before we put people in the scanner, uh, we first gave them some uh, training uh, so that they would know the spatial uh, layout of the uh, museum uh, and where everything was. Uh, so first we just gave them 15 minutes of free exploration. This is just like your um, desktop VR, you're just like you're playing a video game, you can navigate around. Um, and in the free exploration, the only uh, thing we asked them to do is be sure to go into all four museums at least once. Um, and then we gave them about 45 minutes of guided learning uh, where you start down here at the bottom, and you're told to find one of the objects, and you go to it, and then you're told to find another object, and you do that, and you do this until you have uh, gone to each object twice. Um, and then once the subjects uh, have this training, then we put them in the scanner, and we record their brain activity while they are retrieving this spatial knowledge that they just learned. Uh, the specific task that we gave them uh, to retrieve their spatial knowledge is uh, known as a judgment of relative direction task. So, as you see here, on each trial, uh, they are prompted uh, by words to imagine they're facing one of the objects uh, in the museum. Uh, so let's say, facing the cake, so they have to imagine that they're facing the cake. And then the second line here is uh, the target, so they didn't have to say whether the bike would be to their left or to their right uh, from that point of view. Okay. Um, the critical thing here is actually the first thing, is that this task requires them to reinstantiate a spatial situation on each trial, to sort of put themselves in a the location and facing a heading. So it's like they are reorienting themselves on each trial. Um, and I want to emphasize here that the only stimuli they actually see in the scanner are these words. They don't actually see this map or pictures uh, of the environment, although in later studies we've found that we get similar results if you do this sort of same thing but show them pictures instead of words. Yes? Just, the, the, the second facing the lamp, was that going to be in the same exhibit, or could that be in a different exhibit? Uh, you mean the target? Yeah. Yeah, the target is always in the same museum. We found that, in fact, an interesting lab, they really could not do it if it was like in a different museum. And that may be relevant to interpreting the results, so you might want to hold on to that thought. Okay. Uh, so how we analyze the data? We're uh, collecting this at fMRI data. Uh, well, we used a technique known as multi-voxel pattern analysis, which I think probably some people know about anyway. I'll, I'll explain it anyhow. Um, it's based on the idea, or the fact, uh, that the fMRI signal is collected in these sort of individual units known as voxels, voxels like a three-dimensional pixel. So even if we're interested in what looks like here, this small region of the brain, the retrospinal complex, if we zoom in there, we see that the fMRI signal um, <coughs> might consist of 50 to 100 voxels. So we can look at the activation pattern across these 50 to 100 uh, voxels. So let's say that this is the activation pattern when uh, the subject is imagining facing uh, object one. Uh, we can then compare that to the activation pattern when the subject is imagining facing object two. Uh, for simplicity, I'll just represent these patterns as one-dimensional vectors. So 
even though these are different objects, they're both views facing the same direction. Okay. So if this region is representing your imagined heading, then you would expect uh, these two patterns to be similar to each other. In contrast, if we compare uh, view one to, let's say, this view, view three, which is facing a different direction, we would expect these two patterns to be dissimilar if, in fact, this region is representing heading. <coughs> Uh, in fact, the data bear this out. Uh, if you just compare the views within a given museum, uh, within a single museum, you find that the views that face the same direction are more similar than views uh, facing different directions. So uh, one and two are similar to each other, uh, and they're different from three and four, but three and four are similar to each other, five and six are similar to each other, and seven and eight are similar to each other. Okay. So that shows you that this region is representing your imagined heading, but it doesn't really tell you uh, what coordinate frame you're using. So, uh, what's the reference frame? Um, and uh, there, there are multiple possibilities which actually we can disentangle by uh, comparing views across museums. So one possibility is that heading is being coded globally here. So say north, south, east, west relative to the larger part. If this is the case, then views one and two in this museum should elicit patterns that are similar to 15 and 16 in the other museums, because these are both north. Three and four would be similar to nine and 10 and so on. Another possibility, which of course is the one that we're sort of looking for, is the idea that heading is coded relative to local geometry. In this case, one and two should be similar to nine and 10. Three and four should be similar to 11 and 12. So first we analyzed the data in terms of a global uh, coding to see if we found anything, but here there was no evidence for global coding. Uh, so views facing the same global direction in different museums don't give you any more similar patterns than uh, different uh, headings. Uh, so we can reject this, but if we look at local uh, coding, we found strong evidence uh, for local uh, coding. Okay. So what do I think this means? What have I showed you? Well, the, first of all, that RC is coding heading during spatial reorientation. Second, that the heading representations generalize across these environments that have the same local geometry, and that shows you that the heading is being coded relative to the local uh, geometry. And that's sort of what we were uh, looking for. Right, so that maybe it's to support it, supports this mechanism. Uh, and just to show you the data a different way, which I think maybe makes it clear, uh, here I am uh, showing you the similarity between all views and a reference view. So the reference view is right here, and so the numbers just rep, uh, represent how similar the patterns are between this view and all other views. And you can see that uh, the same direction is very similar and same local direction in the other museum. And although I'm showing you this for this reference view, it will work for, it actually works for any reference view. Um, and of course, I've been focusing here on this retrospinial region. You might say, what about the rest of the brain? I mean, maybe every region of the brain does this. Seems unlikely, but uh, this is the results of a whole brain searchlight analysis, which is basically, you do the same analysis, but without a, a predefined region of interest, uh, see if there are any other regions of the brain that, uh, well, shows you what regions of the brain show this effect uh, even without an anatomical hypothesis, and we can see the effect is quite localized. It comes up in RSC and actually unexpectedly in the superior parietal lobe. Uh, but this shows you that even if we didn't know to look in the RSC, it, um, we would have uh, found uh, that this effect is uh, there in that region. Okay. Uh, so this suggests that this retrospinal complex is performing this operation of extracting your orientation relative to local geometry. So that brings to the third, obviously, the next question, which is, okay, let's go back another stage. How do we perceive the uh, visual scene? How do we uh, perceive this local spatial structure? Um, so that's the third part of the talk. All right, now, I'm actually gonna switch gears a little bit. Um, not entirely, it's not really gonna be, it's gonna seem like I'm switching gears, but I'm not entirely switching gears. And I'm gonna focus on an aspect of the uh, local geometry, which is not the overall shape of a room, um, but is a sort of uh, maybe what you might call the fine scale uh, local geometry. And that's what I'm going to call the navigational affordances of the scene. What do I mean by that? Well, if you look at a scene like this one, one thing that's very, very salient is where you can go in the scene, right? So you can go left around the counter, you can go right around the counter, but you can't go straight ahead. Okay. So in this section, I'm going to uh, explain how that aspect of the local scene, of the geometry of the local scene is represented. 
And uh, to anticipate, it's going to turn out that this uh, third scene selected region, the occipital place area, seems very important for processing that information. By the way, I'm not going to talk about the parahippocampal place area, even though, as Eileen alluded to, I've spent 15 years of my life studying that region of the brain, and I still find it kind of interesting, but I'm still not going to talk about it. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, all right. So how do we get at this issue of uh, navigational affordance as well? Uh, we started out by using uh, artificial uh, scenes as stimuli. Uh, and the great merit of these scenes is that you can control everything. So here is a very simple scene uh, where there's one exit and that's to the left. Um, here is the same scene, or it's basically the same uh, shape room um, and same covering on the walls, but here the exit is straight ahead. And here's something with the same navigational affordance, this exit straight ahead, but it's a uh, different uh, room. Um, so using these artificially uh, rendered rooms, um, we created stimuli um, that had eight different affordance conditions which were defined uh, by the locations of the exits uh, in the room. Um, and we created many different versions of these with like different shaped, uh, different shaped doors um, and different uh, wallpapers on the wall. Um, and presented them to our subjects. So we're going to look for a region of the brain that distinguishes between these conditions in its uh, activation patterns. Now, um, of course, you might be able to do this on the basis of just low-level visual features. So here there's some cluster of features on the left, which isn't present here. Uh, so to just to make sure that any results we find are uh, not uh, explained by low-level visual features, we also include a set of conditions where we all had the same affordance conditions, but here, whenever there isn't a door, there's a painting on the wall. So for all these stimuli, there's always three things in the same part of the visual field, uh, but sometimes it's an opening, and sometimes it's not something you can go through. So, very simple experiment. We put people in the scanner, and we show them the stimuli, and we're going to look to see if there's any region of the brain that sort of represents this, uh, the locations of the axis. Now, in this case, we're, we're very interested in just how you perceive uh, this uh, information. Um, so we were not interested in like high-level navigational planning or anything like that. Um, so we did, gave them a task that didn't require any navigational planning, uh, and that is that they were simply uh, asked to fixate, and there were two dots on the top of uh, each stimulus, uh, and they had to report whether the two dots uh, were the same color or not by pressing the button. Um, and in fact, uh, we never told our subjects here that we were interested in the locations of the exits. Um, that was something uh, that uh, was unknown uh, to them. So we're basically trying to see if there's any region of the brain that represents this navigational affordance information. We are just doing a very simple uh, perceptual task. Um, now, how do we analyze the data? Uh, again, we're going to look at multivoxel patterns, but um, in this case, we're going to use a variant of multivoxel pattern analysis known as a representational similarity analysis. Um, again, I don't know. Some people are nodding. Okay, that, that they're familiar with this. So the idea here is uh, first you uh, create a matrix um, that represents what you would predict the similarities um, between the patterns to be um, if uh, the region was uh, representing the information you're, you're looking at. So here we have eight different conditions. And each condition uh, we can represent its affordance structure. This is a simple vector. So left is 1, 0, 0 center at 0, 1, 0, and then this matrix is just uh, reflects the overlap in uh, the axis uh, that's calculated by the Hamming distance. Um, and then we can compare the stimulus dissimilarity matrix to the neural dissimilarity matrix, which is based on the uh, similarity of the multivoxel uh, patterns, the idea being that, well, if a region is really representing the affordance structure, then this matrix should be similar to this matrix. And we did this analysis uh, in our three scene selected regions, the parahippocampal place area, the retrospinal complex, and the occipital place area, and also early visual cortex is kind of a control to just see what that region of the brain is doing. And when we did this, we found something very uh, striking, and that is that we get a very strong effect in the occipital place area, but not in the other three regions, suggesting that this region really is uh, perhaps the region that's representing this affordance uh, information. Uh, now, we thought that was pretty good, uh, but of course, these are like these artificial scenes, and uh, so we wanted to see if we could uh, get a similar result on real-world scenes. 
I actually told my postdoc, Mick Bonner, who was doing this, I said, that's great, but do it on real scenes, and I'll, certainly it will fail. Um, but, you know, you should do it because, you know, if it works, then maybe it's real, but it won't work. Um, but it didn't work, as you'll see. So first, so we presented people uh, with real world scenes like this one, indoor scenes, uh, actually 50 uh, indoor scenes. Um, to define the affordance structure here, uh, we had, um, couldn't construct these, so we used raters. Um, we just asked them to map out from the bottom of the scene all possible pathways through the scenes. Um, and then if you average over all subjects, you get this heat map uh, representing the affordance structure of the scene. Here's another example. Here's another example. And then we take this uh, map of roots here, and then we convert that into this histogram of the uh, angles that, uh, from which you can go from the uh, bottom. So this is just a, another way of representing the affordance structure. And from that, we construct the stimulus dissimilarity matrix uh, between our 50 images. Um, and we actually chose the images such that this matrix is not correlated with some other low-level stuff like a GIST model or an intentional saliency model. Um, again, we wanted to give people a task that didn't explicitly uh, refer to the affordance structure, um, but we decided to give something a little more high-level and naturalistic here. The task here was uh, simply for each picture to press a button indicating whether it was a bathroom or not, so you're going through your scene images, you press left button, no bathroom. Right, oh, see, it's very easy. Okay. Mm -hmm. Here are the results I showed you previously for the artificial scenes, and here are the results uh, for the real world scenes. So we uh, found a nice replication, once again, a strong effect in the occipital place area. In this case, there's a little bit of effect in the parahippocampal place area, but if you contrast these bars, the effect in the OPA is stronger than the effect in uh, all the other regions. Um, and if you do a whole brain searchlight analysis, the only area of the brain that shows this effect uh, for either artificial or real world scenes is the occipital place area. Um, so, um, what does this have to do? I want to come back to the idea of spatial geometry. What does this have to do with spatial geometry? I think there's actually one piece of evidence that actually that the OPA is generally involved in the perception of spatial geometry. Um, so, these data uh, show that the OPA represents the affordances, which are basically where you can go in the scene. Uh, previously, I was talking about the boundary, the geometry is defined by the boundaries of the scene. That's kind of the complement, I think, really. That's uh, you know, where you can't go, but really these things together are both the geometric aspects of the scene. Um, and I think in many cases, although for the artificial scenes, we were careful to make sure that these things were explicitly decorrelated from each other. Um, in real world scenes, they're going to tend to be correlated, right? So where you can go is very much defined by the boundaries. Um, and although I don't have time to tell you about it, uh, a TMS study that we did uh, found that if you interrupt processing in the OPA, you actually have trouble perceiving boundaries. It all fits with the idea that this area is generally involved in the uh, uh, perception of the geometry of the scene. So to summarize what I showed you, I showed you uh, that the hippocampal uh, cognitive map is oriented by geometry uh, when animals have, or presumably people as well, have to recover their sense of direction. Um, I showed you that the rectus lineal complex, which provides uh, inputs to the hippocampal region, uh, seems to uh, support this operation of representing your heading relative to local geometry, which is key for aligning the cognitive map. And I showed you that the occipital place area extracts the spatial features of the scene, uh, like the uh, geometry that allow you to understand how you're oriented relative to local geometry. Um, so I just want to talk very, very briefly, I know I'm about out of time, um, about what is a cognitive map anyway. This is just, I'll just present three or four slides. This is sort of what I'm thinking about uh, right now. <coughs> so uh, when I introduced the idea of a cognitive map at the beginning of the talk, uh, I said it's like a coordinate system. It's a grid on top of the campus here, right? And this actually is sort of like the classical notion of the cognitive map, is that it's a Euclidean uh, reference frame. So here's a quote from O'Keefe and Nadal. Um, they say, absolute space embodies the notion of a framework or container within which material objects can be located, but which is conceived as existing independently of particular objects and objects in general. In this book, we shall be sticking our necks out and taking the strong position that the metric of the, Euclidean, of the cognitive map is Euclidean. So really, it's a, it's a reference frame, it's a container, 
um, you know, within which you can plot different things, and you know, they're arguing that it's a Euclidean a reference frame. So very much like this. Um, but if you look at the way people represent real environments, it's really much more complex. So this is a figure from a book, The Image of the City, from Kevin Lynch. Um, Lynch was actually a geographer, not a psychologist, um, but his data, I think, are very relevant. He um, <laughs> asked people, um, you know, how they, you know, how they uh, represented, how they thought about their home city, in this case, Boston. Um, and this is sort of, figure sort of as a collation of their reports. And what this shows here, what he's trying to get across here, is that it's not like it's just a sheet of graph paper. It's really very structured. They represent the city in terms of paths, in terms of edges, like a riverbank, uh, different nodes, like a, a city square where things come together, districts, and, and landmarks. So there's all this structure to their uh, mental map of the world. Um, and in fact, there's a longstanding uh, cognitive psychology literature that suggests that our uh, spatial knowledge is, is structured. It's, it's not like a, a simple Euclidean metric. Uh, we group together places. Um, into clusters or regions. There are different re uh, ways in which our spatial judgments are distorted by that. In fact, even distance estimates are often found to be asymmetric. So if you ask people what's the distance from A to B, and later ask them what's the distance from B to A, they don't give you the same answer. The answer depends on which is the bigger or more important uh, uh, landmark. I think I'll skip over this, but uh, we don't know that much about um, you know, where this structure comes from. But I think some of the data I showed you uh, indicates some evidence of something that's not a Euclidean metric, but something more complicated, what we might call like a spatial schema. So this sort of uh, replication of the same uh, local direction in different environments is, is like interesting, because it's like you have a, a, a sort of a spatial, uh, some sort of spatial framework which you can apply to multiple environments. Um, and I know I'm zipping through here, but this is just behavioral, uh, sort of a similar thing. It's a behavioral uh, study where we look at uh, when people are asked to navigate to different locations, different objects here, with all the objects removed. Uh, what, if they make errors, what kind of errors do they make? And what you see here is something very interesting, and that is that if subjects are trying to get here, they will very often make this uh, very interesting error where they will go to what is like the right location, uh, but in the wrong museum. So it's like they have a spatial schema for what they're trying to get to locally, but they don't apply it to the right uh, museum. Uh, so what I think is going on here is that, you know, our spatial representation of the world is a little more complex than what we uh, normally uh, think of in the classical formulation. So yes, I do think that we form like a Euclidean uh, metric, particularly for local environments, uh, but I think we might also form some kind of these, uh, uh, I like using the term spatial schema, which might represent like the actual organization and the location of the entrances and exits to that environment. And these schemas might be potentially replicable and uh, applicable to multiple environments. And actually, this sort of representation, I think, might form the core of some other kind of uh, knowledge which has been discussed in the literature. And that's the idea that we might uh, represent uh, our spatial knowledge in the form of a like, graph-like representation of how different uh, sub-environments are related to each other. And although, um, it, oops, not quite there. Although it, these, uh, types of knowledge, graph knowledge and Euclidean metric are often discussed as their alternatives. I think in reality we can start to think about how they all sort of fit together in a sort of rich and complex cognitive map of the world. And with that, I'd like to thank everyone who did the work and everyone who funded it and you for listening. Thank you. Um, so that the last experiment that you showed, we were comparing, you know, walking through a gift shop versus you showed the bathroom scene. Did you actually explicitly compare bathroom scenes where sort of the, the distance one might navigate, if one could navigate yeah, good at all, question. versus? Yeah. So I we made a yeah. So made to claim. So I, um, so there's a version of your question, <laughs> which I think you may be asking. Yeah, it's the next question I thought I'd ask. Yeah. Okay. I mean, you could explicitly try to do that where you have yeah. a, a distance that you could navigate versus yeah. this room versus. Yes. Yeah, good point. So, we didn't, so, although we gave them a task that we thought made no explicit reference to the affordances of the scene, um, it is not necessarily the case uh, that the affordance information may play no role in performing that task, right? Um, so, it's, it's, it's possible that there's a 
that um, if you just had like a computational system that extracted affordances that you would find that you actually can classify bathrooms uh, on the basis of that uh, in information. So you think if you if you did just ran an experiment where you just showed scenes or had them navigate in scenes where you vary that in this occipital place area, do you actually think that you could see some variation in topography based on, if that makes sense, like if I'm going to navigate down a trail that I can see, um, that might differentially activate the region of this occipital place area. Yeah. As opposed to a gas scene. Um, it's the question. The I question is whether that distance is, is the, the, the distance that one can navigate yeah. mapped onto the occipital place area. Oh, you mean just a distance as opposed to more complex? Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. So actually, there have been studies done uh, prior to this where one of the things they manipulate is just like how open and closed the scene is, or uh, you know, is it near or far? Mm -hmm. And you do get that information in the occipital place area, and in particular the parahippocampal place area. So I want to make clear that I'm not, I'm not trying to argue that this is the only thing that the occipital place area does. Um, so and I'm certainly not trying to argue that there isn't any information up there that it isn't relevant to, say, a classification of the scene in terms of a certain category, right? I actually think that there's, you know, there's visual features that are extracted there are going to be useful for, for many, many different tasks. And uh, I think what this shows is that it includes uh, information uh, that would potentially allow you to say, is there an exit to the left, is there an exit to the right? Probably, almost certainly includes information that uh, would allow you to say, you know, is, is it near, can you go far in the scene, uh, you know, it, is it open, is it closed? Uh, as a matter of fact, in a sort of a follow-up uh, study that we did, a computational study, um, uh, Nick, my postdoc, had the idea of using a convolutional neural network to look at this, and he um, used a network uh, that was actually trained on scene classification, so is it, is it a bathroom? Um, and even though that, or you know, is it a bathroom, is it a kitchen, is it a forest, right? And even though that network was trained on this uh, categorization task, he found that uh, in the intermediate levels of the network, there was information about affordances, right? So I don't, you know, I, I think like the visual system is, is uh, tends to uh, extract features that are going to be useful for many different tasks. Does that sort of answer you? Sure. Okay, yeah. Yes? Lots of creatures and lots of humans evolved and navigate in like deserts and prairies yeah. and mm -hmm. environments that are much less geometric than, yeah. than this. How, how, how do those creatures get around? How does This system seems so dependent on a very particular kind of visual cue and visual organization. Yeah. Well, I mean, we know that there, there are different, many creatures use different navigational strategies, right? You know, so, um, you know, desert ants um, determine their heading based on where the sun is, right? Um, and they use that as a compass, right? Um, uh, I don't think there's evidence that we necessarily uh, can, can use this. This is actually a question that's come up many, I think it's, all, it's often asked, which is like, what is the sort of natural equivalent of the shape of the chamber? Um, so I think most environments that we're in, there, are, there usually is uh, something, um, but it's true that like if you're really in a flat desert, um, with really no features, like no, it's hard to imagine like no topographical, you know, like there wouldn't be like sure. an, out, an out, outcropping or a slant, even like the slope of the ground actually, which is uh, shown to be an important cue for reorientation. Um, that, you know, I think counts as like a, a geometric uh, feature, so. Oh, but the desert is a good example because that's ever changing. What's that? The slope is never constant, so that's a good example. So it's, yeah, okay. so even these features yeah. are yeah. Yeah. Right. But I mean, people get lost in deserts, right? right. So, right. <laughs> yeah. Get lost in the ocean. Yeah. So, yeah, in the ocean, you have to use, um, mostly you have to use celestial uh, beacons, right? So, you know, there's a whole uh, system for right, using the sun, the stars, and, and whatnot to navigate. So, yes. So, I think this is all very cool. Um, but you study navigation, but what you presented to us yeah. was static, yeah. you know, this place, this place, this place. Yeah. Do you have anything, any data, or have you studied how 
what's happening in real time as you move from one place to another. So for example, yeah. on the Penn campus, yeah. if you're trying to get from one place to another and you think yeah. you can go down Locust Walk, but actually you have to cross over the bridge, uh -huh. um, are your, you know, are, are, are both possibilities firing as you're yeah. trying to figure out, no, where am I actually? So this is a very astute observation. And what it points out is uh, a little bit of a cheat in my introduction, right? Because I started out by saying, I'm gonna tell you about navigation, but in fact, <laughs> I did not. I told you, well, I told Well, that's you, one way out of it, to well, say you're not studying the dynamic well, part. No, I mean, I think um, there are many different elements in navigation, right? And I'm telling you about one element, which I think is very important, and it's uh, what I call spatial reorientation, which is uh, when you are, have lost your internal uh, sense <coughs> of which way you're facing and where you are, how do you recover that information? How do you use the, uh, uh, surroundings to, to do that, right? There are many different other aspects of navigation, like I don't, the, can, the uh, use of geometry is actually uh, very specific to that problem of being disoriented, right? If you are uh, navigating around and you're not disoriented, uh, actually there's evidence that geometry is one of many cues uh, that, you, that, that you might use. Other cues then become uh, more salient, right? Um, so, you know, landmark guided uh, even the term landmark guided navigation is landmark guided navigation when you're disoriented and there's landmark guided navigation when you're oriented. Um, another problem which I talked about in the beginning but I didn't explain it all in this talk is like how, how do you actually plan the group, right? Uh, so you know there's now evidence which I alluded to uh, that uh, you know when animals are preparing to go somewhere that you they actually there are sequences of hippocampal place cells that fire um, that sort of trace out the route that they're that they're going to go, right? Um, I didn't talk about that at all, but that's another that's aspect. Cool. Yeah, so, um, you know, I actually wrote a review recently on cognitive map navigation, and this is the use of uh, landmarks in order to orient the cognitive map. This is one part, and then there, and the route planning is another whole part of uh, cognitive map-based uh, navigation, which, you know, people are starting to study, but I'm starting to study, but I don't really have any data. So. I'm not going to let you off the hook. I want to follow this up just one yeah. in one way, which is um, mechanistically justify yeah. all I had access to was looking at these <coughs> place cells firing and so on. How do I, as an organism, know I need to reorient? What is the error signal? What yeah. is the signal that's telling me I need to do this thing? Yeah. Is there some I mean, you mentioned this sort of sequence of capital place yeah. cells firing, and I can imagine sort of predictive thing yeah. going on, and, and it fails, and that. Yeah. I mean, yeah, what's the signal that's so driving? There, there are two possibilities. Um, one possibility is that if you're navigating around, you should be able to predict what you see, and that uh, if there's a mismatch between uh, what you expect to see and what you see, then you know that you, something's wrong, right? Um, the other possibility is that, um, which I think is more likely in rodents than humans, is that you know, there is some path integration signal um, and somehow you're able to internally uh, monitor uh, the sort of coherence of that signal, right? So that you can tell, it's like, oh, I've just lost, lost it. So, in fact, there are two different situations. One is you think you know where you are and where you're, where you're facing, but you look at it and you're like, oh, I'm, that's not right. You know, and the other is just like, you know you're lost, right? You know you don't have any internal coordinates to even think about. Uh, that's disorientation, so. Um, I don't know the actual neural mechanism for that, but you're right, that is something that you would have to do, yeah. Uh -huh. So I feel like I'm terrible at reorienting myself when I go outside, yeah. and I'm actually, I was really relieved to realize why I'm always 180 degrees off yeah. when I'm supposed to go. Um, because you're always in rectangles. Exactly, <laughs> you're always in rectangles. Um, but I feel like that's not necessarily true for everyone. So yeah. do you have a sense of where these individual differences might come from? Um, yeah. Um, so the best, first of all, you're correct about the individual differences, um, and I think actually uh, spatial navigation is like a really interesting domain to study individual differences because there is such variability, which, you know, is not correlated with intelligence or anything like that, right? In fact, um, <laughs> you know, when I was in the job market I, many thousand years ago, 
I would go around and I would give a talk and then these very brilliant scientists would say, like, I'm always disoriented. And I'd say, well, I've developed this theory that it's actually inversely correlated with intelligence. <laughs> so anyway, there you go. How many job offers did Flattery you get? Flattery eyes get it. <laughs> I did get a job. Um, Martha Barrett could not have a short way to say you boss. Um, so one uh, po possibility, there's a work uh, by Mary Hegarty. Um, which she developed a scale, the Santa Barbara Sense of Direction scale. And uh, the sort of core of that is this, this ability to just keep track of your, of your direction, which in neural terms uh, probably relates to the integrity of the head direction uh, system. Um, so, or it may be that uh, some people, the head direction system doesn't work quite as well uh, to keep, uh, upda keep updating that sense of direction as you move, move around. But that seems to be like the most important uh, aspect that differentiates people, differentiates people who are sort of like good navigators from, from bad navigators. Then the internal compass, right? Some, some people have it, other people don't have it and can't even conceive of the idea mm -hmm. that you would be able to do that. So, I mean, there are probably other things as well, but I think that's important. Yes? Dare I bring up the old common wisdom that uh, uh, women na navigate by landmarks and men are yeah. cognitive maps. Uh, you may, <laughs> but, I have, but I have nothing to say about that. <laughs> I mean, uh, partly, for probably pra partly for practical reasons, pra partly for ideological reasons. <laughs> the uh, practical reason is, is that, um, you know, our fMRI studies are barely have sufficient power to look overall, right? So um, we rarely have enough power to look at uh, to dip sex differences. And the ideological uh, reason is, is that I feel that if you say anything about sex differences, you have a direct line to the New York Times. So I, I, don't, I don't want to do that. <laughs> That's so, what I fear. Yeah, yeah. So I don't want, yeah. I'm not saying they don't exist, but I've not really studied them. So, yes. Um, I have a question, I guess, similar to the desert conundrum. Since we do know that there are groups of humans who do navigate by compass directions, um, and they can point to very specific compass directions in rooms with no windows and things like that, yeah. this, this clearly seems What are you talking about? These are uh, groups in Australia. Australia the ones who use the sort of not left right, but the allocentric. Mm -hmm. cool. They yeah. use, yeah, a cardinal direction. Yeah. Today. It's yeah. like very specific. It's not just yeah. northeast, but yeah. those kind of yeah. directional navigation. So it seems like maybe this isn't, this it can't be because of culture and yeah. cultural differences interfering with these kind of things. It can't be mapped onto just humans as a species the way we can map it onto mice as a species or rats as a species. So then how would you go about mapping the contours, so to speak, of which groups of humans this applies to and which it doesn't? Oh, so you're suggesting. Um, well, that has to do with your sort of ability to path integrate, right, and to keep track of your direction, right? So um, I guess what you're s suggesting is that there are a group of uh, people who always have to do that, right? So as in our society, there are many people who never really know what telecentric direction they're facing. In that society, you can't uh, communicate uh, unless you can do that, right? Because you have to say, you know, this is on the east side of the table. So uh, it'd be fascinating to uh, know um, how people learn that, right, uh, in that society. If it takes a long time, uh, one thing that I would, one thing that I would be very, very interested to know is that is that, and maybe you know the answer to this, is that something that you uh, know within the environment that you're very familiar with? In which case, you know, you could almost like learn in, you know, this in this room, this is always to the east. In this room, this, this is always to the east. Or you know, when I see this landmark. That's always to the east. Um, or does it? Uh, do they have this ability, which you can then potentially plop down on somewhere else, and they would immediately uh, start uh, keeping track of their uh, direction? Right. I don't know the answer. Yeah, it's actually that. So they they did find that um, right. it's not based on a particular landscape or yeah. landmarks that they can do this. Yeah. Put them on a plane and, yeah. and put them in Paris. They can do they took that there. No, that's an example, but, okay. <laughs> but um, yeah. and very young children can do it as yeah. well. So huh. It seems like, although they, they could also be using things like this, map on top of this yeah. other thing, but it seems like they're, they're kind of operating on a different system, and that kind of leaves yeah. open the question of then, are there, is there even a third or fourth or fifth way 
of like especially when you're talking about indigenous groups that people might be. So are they around. never disoriented? Is that sort of the idea? Sorry. Are they never disoriented? Is yeah. This, okay. <laughs> so, so, so we need to test them in rectangular rooms and see what they do. Yeah, right? that would be super interesting. Yeah, okay. Or, or circular rooms. Circular, circular rooms. Circular rooms, rooms. Mm -hmm. no, we Yeah. <laughs> By some go to corner. So there's no, in if, it's, yeah. if they're doing you know, concentration and they're yeah. bringing yeah. the orientation <coughs> from outside into yeah. the room, yeah, yeah. it shouldn't matter if it's circular. Right. Uh, yeah. There's no internal use. Is there another question or are we done? <laughs> there could be another question. Yes, back there. I have a similar question because we're both coming from the opposite problem. So I'm thinking that, uh, well, we're, obviously we live in a very structured, uh, very geometrical uh, world. How much of, uh, of this new thing is learned and how much do things are learned? Meaning, if you were, to, if you were able to bring uh, people who live in the Amazon into the MRI, I would say, yeah. I suspect will be very difficult for the customer. Uh, would you expect any difference? So people have no. I mean, the the, uh, the, use, of, the use of geometry, right, um, as a strong cue for reorientation is one that's found in, in many species, right? The sort of uh, almost exclusive use of geometry is one that's. Uh, maybe not as universal, even within species, as you know, some of the initial data though, would have suggested, right? Um, so I, I do think that there are computational reasons why uh, geometric information um, is important. I mean, I explained one, right, which is the, uh, the durability uh, of it. Um, there might be other uh, reasons why it, um, it, it might, it's particularly useful for the retrieval of uh, any. So. But I, I mean, I, I expect that there would be some variability depending on exactly what you have learned in the nature of, the nature of your environment. Some have argued that uh, the rats really use the shape because they're used to going around in, in burrows, right? Uh, but you can find it, the same sort of thing in fish, um, you know, in chickens, and m many different species. So, um, but I'm not saying it's going to be absolutely, you know, the same degree um, of using that cue in in every culture or every uh, species. I guess another way to approach this would be environmental studies, but I think that would be even more problematic because you can go yeah. early enough and yeah. life stage still. I mean, what, I mean, one thing I, mean, I, I want to make clear is like, to me the interesting thing, oh look, geometry is important and we found a, an area of the brain that it retrieves your heading relative to geometry. I think that region of the brain is going to be involved in this operation mm -hmm. potentially for other cues, right? So, um, you know, it's like, this is like the using your environmental cues to orient yourself. That is one of the things that RSC is doing. Um, and, you know, there, there are going to be cases where, you know, maybe it's not the shape of the room. Maybe it's something else that you're using. And, you know, with regard to mapping out how this uh, works in the brain, that's okay. Right? I think. So, yeah. Right? Thank you. Yeah.